the theoretical framework. There's a lot of information you can find, of course, in books. You can find them in popular search engines online. But what you're going to find predominantly is that relevant related theories to that of the research topic. In this case, your research topic. Throughout this lesson, I'll use a couple examples. And one such example is that if you were going to do research in something that deals with process improvement, achieving better quality, systems that are more efficient and effective, maybe perhaps even people to be more efficient and effective. The idea of the theoretical framework is you take concepts of the research you want to do and you ground it into a theoretical framework. It's really the broader body of knowledge. In some essence, that if you are going to do some study on management and proven efficiency, you could be in the body of knowledge that deals with management. It could be the body of knowledge that deals with organizational design. It could be in the body knowledge of leadership. It depends on the actual approach that you look at it from as compared to what somebody else might look at from. It's going to help provide a context on how you are going to approach your work by articulating the theoretical framework. As I like to think in terms of content areas, what content areas are relative to your study? As I mentioned, if you're doing something with process improvement, it could be something that deals with management. It could be a content area that deals in decision making because decision making often is a task or a fundamental job that managers are involved with deciding how to be more efficient and effective in the work that they're doing. Content areas in many cases are the areas that you may study in your academic programs. For example, I teach classes in organizational theory. I teach classes in management theory. I teach classes in leadership theory. These are broad areas and they're content areas that you can usually relate to by the course numbers that you're involved in. The theoretical framework is not something that you can readily find available and thus the problem many have. Uh, people like to say, well, where can I find a theoretical framework? You have to do a fair amount of reviewing of the literature. You have to have an understanding of the related frameworks before you can define this for your study. You may have to literally spend time in the library or through books and find out who the fundamental authors were of theories when they were originated. The confusing part here is that you may read one dissertation study that was published and it had one type or maybe two different theoretical frameworks it applied and you read yet another dissertation that was published and you see different ones. This is okay and this is understandable because each author it may see the same problem differently. If you think in terms of an accident where several people see the exact same thing but we call it different. That's a great example of a theoretical framework because you may have a focus that you come at it from where I might have a different focus. Perhaps because my focus is ingrained in process improvement from Frederick Taylor in the late 1800s, early 1900s, I see how process improvement has evolved over time. And I may look at a situation today in that type of frame where you might see it from a transformational leadership frame. That doesn't make either of us wrong. It just means that because you may ground it differently than I do, the work that you do could fundamentally be different than what I would do. You have to know the content areas to know the masters, the seminal authors or theorists. For example, as I mentioned, because my work has a lot to do with quality improvement, things such as process improvement, Six Sigma, Lean Six Sigma. The fundamental authors who I believe had and continue to have influence on that are people such as Frederick Taylor, Dr. Deming. Perhaps it's also people who are more current in what they're doing, perhaps who have created Six Sigma or who are known really well for their management philosophies in other areas related to process improvement. You have to have a certain level of content knowledge and that's why in many doctoral programs 
they spend the first year in a number of different content areas such as management, organizational theory, leadership theory that help give you a foundation to depart from. Wherever you can learn and get a better understanding of the masters, those who have really created the fundamental frameworks of the early days is the best thing that you can do to help yourself gain a better understanding of the framework that you're working within. This is one of the reasons why I like to, and I always encourage students to create taxonomies, a taxonomy of different authors in different topic areas, so that way they'll know who created what aspect of each type of content and what type of information that's out there, where it came from. The theoretical framework grounds and connects today's work with that of the previous research. By looking back, we're able to then show perhaps how things have changed over the years. And Frederick Taylor's work that happened in the late 1800s, early 1900s, when his book was published for the first time, his work was about time and motion studies. And from that later 50 years almost when Dr. Deming, Dr. Duran, and other people were working in Japan, they started creating other models and extending the work from Taylor to other perhaps a little bit more scientific measurements. From there, we saw some greater changes in the 1970s and 80s when perhaps we started to see things happening Six Sigma and then Lean Six Sigma, perhaps to where we are today where processes are so well refined that an organization can make millions of items with very few mistakes or very few problems that occur because their systems and the people are so well in tune together to be able to be proficient and be optimized as an organization. But we look to find what past connections, it's kind of like a history of your family. If you have heart disease, if you look back perhaps at your parents or your grandparents and their grandparents before that, you may find that there's a history that's connected to who you are today. And by knowing some information about your past or what has contributed to who you are today from the past, it allows you to make better decisions on your health. Or it may have a better understanding for you to know where you came from because that's where some of your fundamental philosophies were born from and they were brought up into you as you were a child and maybe as you were growing up as an adolescent and you carry some of those same ideas around today. That's really what we're doing with your doctoral dissertation work is we're grounding what you're doing today with something from the past to show a logical connection that you're not just coming up with some bright idea that's not going to extend the body of knowledge somehow some way. The theoretical framework in essence, provides you the opportunity to limit your view. Think about a pair of blinders that if you had on and it took away all the different views that you had outside from the left and to the right of what you're seeing when you're looking straight ahead. You would be very focused on what you're trying to accomplish. Certain paradigms are created because they create patterns. They create, if you will, policies or procedures that allows for us to understand how to be successful within a system. What you're doing with your work through the theoretical framework is providing that view. You're providing your view. Now, again, I may have a different view. That's okay. That's what we hope for when we do research because when we see a lot of people doing research on leadership, even though leadership research has been happening for hundreds of years, we're still doing more because there's still opportunity for improvement with that. There's still ways that we can create and train and make better leaders. So the idea being here that with these blinders, that they're, they're focusing, they're narrowing your view, they're not blinding you completely, but they're blinding you from the miscellaneous information that you don't need to be concerned with. And this can help when you start to develop your research questions and do the research itself for your study. The theoretical framework dwells on time-tested theories that embody the findings of numerous investigations and how a phenomena or whatever your problem that you're looking at in your research study is occurring today. It puts it in the sense of relationship of time. By looking at what Frederick Taylor did, what Dr. Deming did, what others did along the way for management theories, 
it's helpful to understand that knowing that and being grounded will allow us to make sure that we're making wise choices today in the work that we're doing. So we don't repeat the past problems, but we have learned from them and considered them. It doesn't mean we can't do anything new and different, but at least it helps the person who reads our work when it's done can understand that we have heard or read the voices of others and have given them some consideration. And then we went on our path as would be articulated throughout the rest of your study. Position theoretical framework within a broader context of the related frameworks or concepts or models or theories. As you probably have been learning, there are a lot of different leadership theories. There's many different educational leadership theories. There's different theories on how to take care of patients. All the different theories that are out there sometimes are too much and too broad. But when you're doing your work, it helps to frame it within one of those contexts. For example, I have a mentorship model. And I'm going to share that with you later in this lesson. My mentorship model is based on the conceptual framework of Elizabeth Kubler-Ross's death and dying curve. And while I'll share that later, it helps me to be able to ground my work. It helps others to understand that when I'm talking about how I do my mentoring, that it aligns to a certain degree with the methodology or the theory that was created by Elizabeth Kubler-Ross and her death and dying theory. So it helps put a perspective on my work based on somebody else's and now somebody could relate or see interrelationships between the two different theories. The theoretical framework also provides for limitations of the theoretical framework itself when current theory does not explain a certain phenomena. So it provides limitations of the theoretical framework when current theory does not explain a certain phenomena. So for example, let's say in your study you are going to do something new that nobody's ever researched before. Now this does happen. It happens more often in different types of research, not so much doctoral dissertation research, but still at times some students will create an idea or see something or be involved in a work setting where they have the opportunity to research something that's never been done before. This helps now then provide some guidance to the author as well as the reader to know that there is no founding frameworks behind. So it helps to limit the theoretical framework when there's nothing new that's there. And that's really where the conceptual framework comes in because we tend to conceptualize our research ideas early on, which helps us to do a review of the literature, what you'll write about in chapter two. But if there are no theories, then you may not even have a theoretical framework in your dissertation. You may have to write to a conceptual framework because it's the conceptual framework then that tells the reader that there are no foundational theories behind it, that this is something new. And then your ideas on creating your conceptual view then gives the reader an opportunity to see where you're grounding your ideas from. So that's the next thing we move into is the conceptual framework. It's used predominantly where and when existing theories are not valid, that something's new. This may not always be the case of only at this time because some frameworks are not necessarily grounded in theories that are proven that have been tested there are theories that are conceptual based perhaps on human behavior and different topics that one might study in education or in health where perhaps there's not an exact method or science as I have alluded to with the example of quality improvement where we can see literally how different people have tested and analyzed and been able to record time motion studies, process improvement efforts, measure statistical outcomes. Oftentimes, when that's not the case, we may be seeing something of more of a conceptual framework than a theoretical framework. And while it's not always the case, many times qualitative studies are more open for the opportunity to have a conceptual framework included in Chapter 1 instead of a theoretical framework. The conceptual framework provides for a context when none is available. If there is no context to put this into, the idea of your study, if you're looking at a new problem, a new phenomena, then the conceptual framework provides for that context that you would create. And I may see the same exact thing you do, but I may, again, have a different context of the way I would write it, the way I would see it, because I'm different. Doesn't mean that either of us are right or wrong. 
That's the value of perhaps extending people's studies that were done before you because you may come at it with a different framework than I would or that the original author did. So the idea of looking at the context when none are available, there's nothing wrong with creating that context. There's nothing that says you can't be the first one to create a new idea. While it's often rare that it happens doctoral dissertation work, it does happen. And when it does, it's exciting. The theoretical framework helps to explain the observations. So when you put it into a context, as I would read your ideas, as I would read your conceptual framework, it would provide some idea of the observations that you have written and talked about. So I might be able to visualize it. If all goes well with a conceptual framework, particularly something that's never been written about in the past, if I could read what you have wrote and close my eyes and visualize it, then that's powerful. And it allows me to then start relating to what you see. Doesn't necessarily mean I have to agree with it or disagree with it. It just allows me the opportunity to see where you're coming from, the rationale for your thought process and how you're discerning what you believe to be true. The conceptual framework enables the researcher to find links between existing literature and his or her own research. Now, if there's nothing available, that's understandable, but if you're going to do a, an exhaustive literature review, you may find some connections. You may find some links that you can draw upon and connect to to try to make some sort of relationship or reflect an interrelationship from one thing to another. As I mentioned with my model of mentoring that I created, I believe I came up with a new type of theory or approach to doing mentoring, but yet I grounded it in somebody else's work. And so I've been able to do these links to existing literature, suggest how when people go through a death and dying curve, they go through something very similar in a conscious and subconscious way and how they think, act, and behave when they're being mentored. Again, I have that model. I'm going to show that to you in a few seconds. The conceptual framework originates from broad ideas and theories that help a researcher to properly identify the problem they are looking at frame their questions and find suitable literature. Even if the topic has never been researched before, it's your job then to be able to put that scope around it, to be able to create the new paradigm, to be able to close those blinders to a certain extent and help communicate what you see that nobody else has been able to see yet. If you think about the greats who have looked at whether the earth was flat or whether it was round, or how gravity worked. They originally had to come up with a new idea. They had to be able to frame it in a way that other people would perhaps be able to understand who didn't believe in it. And that's exactly what you're doing with the conceptual framework. Oftentimes, you may be doing a review of the literature, perhaps in a library, and you're sitting there for hours, and all of a sudden you see something, and that light goes on in your head, if you will, of, wow, here's a new idea. I never thought of this before. How do I frame this for somebody else to better understand? And when you think about it that way, then that's exactly what you're doing. Try to imagine for a moment explaining to somebody what the ocean looks like from standing on the shore. To somebody who's never seen an ocean. To somebody who's never seen a lake. To somebody who's lived in a desert their whole time. How would you conceptualize your picture how would you paint your, your picture, if you will, for that person to be able to gain an understanding or appreciation for what you talked about? When you start to think about conceptual framework, start to think about those kinds of ideas on how you're articulating your vision to somebody who has never seen that same view and somebody who may not even be able to relate to that. Most academic research uses a conceptual framework on the outset because it helps the researcher to clarify research questions and aims. What this means is oftentimes if you're going to look at an idea that you see that there's a problem in society in the fact that there are more younger people being put in prison than ever before, you may use your conceptual framework to use it as a guide to understanding why that happens. Is it, is it because they're are not receiving the proper education? Is it because they're growing up in broken families uh, without two parents, perhaps? Is it because that they happen to be more in poverty? Or is this happening in small cities or large cities? Is it happening in rural areas? 
the idea being is that as you put that framework out there as you start to look at it, it helps you then decide how you can ask the research questions correctly in a manner that's reflective of the literature. So the conceptual framework often is a place to start and it may actually blossom then into your ideas of creating a theoretical framework. Often a conceptual framework is what you may do to go into writing all the information that you have to write in chapter two or when you're going to the library doing your research on different literature and studies that have been posted and from your conceptual framework your big ideas you start to see that there is perhaps a theoretical framework as the foundation that other people have done and therefore you move from a conceptual framework to a theoretical framework and you would be conceptualizing while you're working on chapter two but as you start to write chapter one in this section where your study is grounded you would be writing about a theoretical framework most human and social phenomena have been researched with various different conceptual frameworks. So as you start to look at if this happens to be something you're looking at, particularly if you're looking at how humans think or behave or how they act in certain situations, you may find that there are many different conceptual frameworks that then lead you into your theoretical framework, particularly if you move from what's going on with their behavior and you start to look at decision theory, how people are making decisions. If they're making decisions on a certain way, you'll find that there are many researchers, fundamental theorists who have been out there for many years who have written a lot of information about how people make decisions. So the idea may be conceptual at first, but as you start to get into it and you move from the frameworks that you create, you start to see some connections. This is the value of better understanding a theoretical and conceptual framework. Theoretical conceptual frameworks and that's something you can write right off the beginning of chapter one. It's work that has to be created. And in the essence of the manner of how you write chapter one, as I'll share in the last part of the program, when all the lessons are combined together, often you may not be able to write this section until long after you have chapter two written and you have found the salient points in chapter two to then go back into chapter one and write this section, or at least to make it where it'll be in its final draft. Here's an example. Constructivism might be seen as a derivative of learning theory. If you're familiar with learning theories, you're also perhaps a little bit understanding of the body of knowledge as it relates to cognitive science. So as you start to look at one area, you start to see how it may be grounded in yet another, but then you get to the body of knowledge, if you will, or you get to your content areas, you'll start to see that there are connections. Early on in your study when if you're starting to look at constructivism you may not see the connection so therefore you have to get a better understanding of learning theory and through that body of knowledge you start to see that there's other relationships or interrelationships and you may go looking at one of those other interrelationships as compared to somebody else and that's how your work can be significantly different than somebody else's but both pieces could be very important collectively for the body of knowledge First, understanding the conceptual framework often provides discerning critical thinking to the theoretical framework. As I mentioned, in many cases, we come up with our ideas, we conceptualize what we want to study. We start to look at different ideas that we want to research on and go do literature reviews on, perhaps, and start to create a format or a framework. And from that conceptual framework of thinking about the big picture, often looking at the macro view, we start to then narrow down to the micro view and we start to see how we can take our critical thinking and find connections in these interrelationships. And that's really what's important with writing a theoretical framework when you're bringing it from a conceptual framework is to show the connections, how you connect the dots. If you're familiar with mind mapping, you may find that as a great tool to conceptualize your work and your ideas put all the different items out there onto a mind map. And then as you start to make the connections, how one is connected to another in that mind map, you might start to see that theoretical framework coming together. And again, it's okay if yours is different than mine because there's nothing to say it should be the same. If it was the same, then we might be a little concerned because then why is that? Is that because we have the same education? Is it because we have both narrow views on the same topic? Not to say that's right or wrong either, but it may be something to look at. Here's an example. 
So can you answer this question? Mentoring doctoral students can be in what body of knowledge? Would it be in the body of knowledge of communications on how people communicate to one another? Perhaps, because in mentoring, somebody is talking with one another. Hopefully, they're both talking. Does it have to do with knowledge management, knowledge transfer, perhaps? You can see how mentoring does relate to transferring of knowledge. How about coaching? Is coaching part of the conceptual framework of, of mentoring doctoral students? How about personal development? Is personal development involved? Or socialization, socialization of new ideas, perhaps. Socialization of moving from a doctorate student to an academic researcher. Could it be something to do with human development, human capital development in particular? I think you start to see here that every item here has something to do with mentoring of doctoral students. And there could be a body of knowledge around each one. Now, if I decided to take my research and go through the body of knowledge of communication because I write books about communication, my research study would be fundamentally grounded in a framework that's different than yours if you were to look at it from the personal development point of view. And you start to cite personal development authors and the works that they've done because you may start to write your research questions in a way that's completely different than mine. But yet we would both be working within the ideas of mentoring doctoral students. And as you start to get more familiar with conceptual framework and theoretical frameworks, you can see perhaps how they get connected and how there's many different paths you can go from. And that's why it's important as you do your work is to ground your knowledge and your rationale so other people can relate to it. So when they're reading your research, they can see the path that you're going down, how you got there. And that's what's really important about a proposal is that you're telling your committee members, you're telling your university how and why you want to do what you're going to do, but the rationale for what you want to do. And oftentimes that gets lost in the communications of creating a proposal. You have to look at it from the big picture when it's done to say, you know, this body of knowledge in these three chapters is communicating to the world what you're going to do, why you're going to do it, and the rationale for doing it so other people can relate to your work. Much like taking that picture of somebody looking at the ocean and, and trying to describe that to somebody who's never seen water like that before. You have to conceptualize it and share the information, perhaps give some rationale for the points of view you've been giving. Conceptual framework is a researcher's idea on how the research problem will have to be explored. Again, you're giving your picture and it helps be able to take that. This is founded on the theoretical framework in a much broader scale of the resolution and saying that when you come to the problem that you're going to research, it's going to provide that scale, that opportunity, that connection to show exactly why those research questions were created and how you're going to test the premise of your work, which your dissertation is going to do in effort to create some information to help lessen the specific problem that you wrote about in chapter one as well. Conceptual framework can provide that opportunity to look at gaps in the knowledge. If you start to see through your work that there's a gap in the knowledge, then you may want to then conceptualize a new approach. When I did my doctoral dissertation, there was a gap in the knowledge that I was able to find that suggested that there was a need for a study in a completely different area where demographics of employees were different than employees elsewhere. So I was able to conclude by identifying that gap in the knowledge that by me extending the study on corporate wellness to a state which was Hawaii had a different demographics that I could substantiate doing the dissertation to create that new knowledge. And so as you start to look for gaps in knowledge, you can start to find other information that somebody just can't see because they don't have your point of view. Here is an example of my executive mentoring model. The curve and the grid are the exact same curve and grid that Elizabeth Kubler-Ross uses in her death and dying curve. What I did is I took her ideas and I conceptualized a new model. I conceptualized how I would go through executive mentoring with people, that I would move from being an advisor, an educator, and a facilitator while they were much in the what I call a learner mode and that there was a transition that as they got to learn more information about themselves, they started to learn more 
and perhaps maybe they didn't feel as well about themselves because they learned new information. Their self-perception was going down because they realized they didn't know as much as they thought they would. Then I take over as a coach, as a strategist, and a role model because here, this is where they move from being a learner to what I call a mentee. The mentee is open to being coached and to take in a strategy so they can get better. They've already learned a lot of information they didn't have before. Now they're looking at how to get better. And they move up to the right-hand side here and they become now a leader, a self-leader, if you will. And the role I take on is an innovator, a troubleshooter, and a peer. So as you can see on the black terms on the inside of this loop, those are the roles I play as my mentees shift fundamentally from the work we're doing from a learner to a mentee to a leader. The same concepts are founded in Elizabeth Kubler-Ross's model of death and dying and how people react to deaths in the family or deaths of a friend or perhaps even death of a pet or loss of a job for that matter. But the ideas are pretty similar and what I was able to do is take her conceptual model and put it into a new model. And while this is conceptually put together, there is some theoretical foundations for learning and in the death and dying curve there are research studies suggest certain theories about how people act and react so the first approach here for me was to conceptualize somebody else's model on my own then articulate it to somebody share it with them and I know I didn't give it justice here in this lesson but when I share it in a longer format I can tell you exactly how I conceive this how I conceptualize the whole idea and then the theories that now support it as well so you can perhaps get a better understanding that by creating your own model from somebody else's could be that conceptualization a conceptual framework that then there may be some logical conclusions to a theoretical framework in my case I could create a theoretical framework I could also be okay and just leave it as a conceptual framework because it is taking somebody else's idea and creating a new concept about it. What I'm going to do now is share several examples from some of my prior mentees. My prior mentee have been very successful in getting their proposals and dissertations approved on the first pastor of committee members, more importantly when their proposals and dissertations were reviewed by their universities. Each student's work that I'm going to share here with you had been approved by them for me to be able to do this. I have written consent from them to be able to do this and they own the copyright. I'm just sharing it with you as an example that's there that may help you. They have agreed to help you as many people had agreed to help them as they were going through the process. So the first example is from Dr. Maria Puente. Her dissertation is called Selling the Lived Experiences of Domestic Property and Casualty Insurance Leaders. Now I'm just going to share some excerpts out of the theoretical conceptual framework from my mentees and so her study she wrote this study was based on change management transformational leadership as a theoretical perspective so you can see here that she grounded the information in the first part of that portion of her chapter one and told the readers exactly where her information was based upon and then she went in to describe two different authors and grounded her ideas out of John Cotter's change management theory and Bernard Bass's transformational leadership model that he provided. So in the essence of what she's been able to do, she was able to tell the reader where her theoretical perspectives were grounded and exactly on two authors that if you're familiar with their work, you get a sense for probably how she's going to approach her study. Here on the second example, Dr. Ellen Beatty in her dissertation titled A Quantitative Correlational Study, Institutional Characteristics and Endowment Investment Performance Following the 2008 and 2000 Financial Crisis, in her section, she started out here literally. The theoretical framework of this study is founded on the theories of higher education, financing, endowment principles, and financial management. You can see she put in there exactly where she's grounding her work for the reader to have a better understanding. She goes on to give related information. She says research does not exist about the effect of economic crisis on either of these relationships that she's talked about. So you can start to see that there's going to be some new information in her study because there's nothing there that she was able to find out. Dr. Joseph Hagee in his dissertation titled Influence of Religion and Religiosity on Leadership Practices in the Workplace. 
a quantitative correlation study, goes on to talk how the conceptual framework of this study is centered on Coisey and Poisoner's leadership practices model uh, for exemplary leadership. They use the conceptual framework that Coisey's and Poisoner has. And so by him giving that information, he then goes on to say the leadership practices model is an integrative theoretical framework of leadership that deals with leadership challenges focusing on the areas that he has here, which are the subheadings of the book itself written by Coises and Poisoners. So in his section, he actually calls this a conceptual framework in his dissertation, whereas others might have actually called it a theoretical framework. Again, I believe there's no one right way or wrong way. And so it depends on how you look at it and how you frame your work, which is going to be how and what is best for your dissertation. Dr. Patricia Schroeder, in her dissertation, a quantitative correlation study of individualism, collectivism, and employee innovation in Turkey, goes on in her work to communicate, as she does here, where Chafal's research in the 1970s introduced the concept of social identity in groups and outgroups as part of research intergroup behavior. You can see how she grounded her ideas in the works from the 1970s. Then she writes, social identity theory purported that part of the individual's conception on self is derived from membership in social groups. You can see connections between her work and these two different pieces that she's writing about here. Of course, you can't see it because you're not able to see the whole dissertation, but you do have access to it if you decide you want to download it from ProQuest Dissertations, and you could literally then see the connections much as you will do in your own work. She goes on in another paragraph, and I highlighted sections here because I think they're the most important. The dimension of individual collectivism has implications for theories of effective leadership in organizations. Because she said that, she's going to start writing and giving some information about those leadership theorists or the one theorist. Here she talks about Hofstede and his work. So we start to see as you go through this that she grounds her work in some information talks about it's going to be grounded in the theories of effective leadership in organization, then gives an author's work who was fundamental in providing information about that. Then the last sentence here, it says, the research study adds to the literature on leadership and effective leadership practices within the context of national culture and the individual collectivism dimension. She narrowed it down, told you exactly how her study adds to the literature, not just leadership in general, but specifically in the practices within the context that she provides. And this is a great example, I believe, of how she was able to give information early on and to show where her information was grounded and then where she took it to. Last example I share with you is from Dr. Susan Kostiniak. Her dissertation is titled Exploring the Experiences of Complementary Therapy Nurses, a Qualitative Phenomenological Study. The way she articulated her conceptual framework, I think, is an ideal way as well, where she started talking about the Newman systems model, expands the concept of person to identify not only the individual, but also the family of the community. Newman's model was influenced by the original works of Nightingale. Dr. Kristiniak is a nurse. Nightingale was one of the founders of information in nursing literature and nursing research. By grounding it, Nightingale, if you know that information, you can start to see how her dissertation work is grounded and how it is being influenced, if you will, by others, can start to see the connections and interconnections coming together to show that her work is just not something that's out there, but it's either grounded in or provides an avenue for creating new knowledge from something else that was already done. So which comes first, the theoretical framework or the conceptual framework? There is no one correct answer to this, and that's the problem with many doctorate students early on trying to write a proposal is they may, one, have confusion what the difference is between the two of them and may not even know that the conceptual framework is, is required or should be written about because they always see or tend to see more so people talking about theoretical framework. There's not one direct path to creating a doctoral proposal. Often you have an idea and you will get a certain amount of review of literature done to help give you enough information to create the theoretical framework. 
Whereas perhaps for some people, if they're doing something that's a little bit more linear or if they want to do something that they already know the framework of, they may be able to write the framework before they do much of the work in Chapter 2 where they're doing the literature review. They may not have to create a conceptual framework because there's nothing new, there's nothing to conceptualize. It's taking somebody else's theory and then maybe building upon it and taking their research questions and their study in a manner that's already in alignment with what's there, but taking another look at it with different independent variables perhaps. Whether you should create a theoretical framework or conceptual framework is, is dependent upon your school, how you were taught, what your beliefs are, but you can see that by doing a literature review, I hope through this lesson, is that as you conceptualize your ideas and you gain a sense for what you want to do, then you can start to ground it in theories that have been produced that help support your ideas. And if not, you may just be that person that's creating something brand new that somebody's never done before. And that's okay too. So then what you do, instead of creating a theoretical framework that's out there, you create your conceptual framework in a manner that helps somebody else understand better what you see. Again, it could be that person who's looking at the ocean and then trying to describe it to somebody else. They're sharing a conceptual framework of how they framed the picture.